Do you live your life on purpose or on accident? When you get up in the morning, will you have a plan for the day? Will you have something that you're seeking to achieve? Or will you go wherever the wind blows you on that particular day? If you're one of those people that doesn't really have a purpose in life, doesn't really have a plan, though that's not really the intent of my sermon this morning, I want to exhort you You need to have purpose. God has put you here on purpose. It's kind of hard to redeem the time and live our lives to his glory if we don't do it with intentionality. But I'm going to assume that the majority of you would at least answer the question and say, yes, I have a purpose. And the purpose would be something like, my purpose is to glorify God. My purpose is to please him. My purpose is to uh, glorify God and enjoy him forever. Maybe you're familiar with that terminology. And that begs the question, how do we do that? How do we glorify God? How do we please him? Well, again, if you're biblically minded, you know that the scripture would say we please him by obeying him, by serving him, by giving ourselves to him. And that leads us to the last of this string of questions. What pleases him? What are his commandments that he wants us to obey? Now, you could approach that biblically from several different vantage points, but I want to draw your attention to what John says here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. He says, this is his commandment. And there are two of them. That we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, that is, that we believe the gospel, that we believe who Jesus says he was, that he was the son of God, that he's our savior, our redeemer, all that is true of Jesus, that we believe that. And the second command is that we love one another just as he commanded us. How are you doing on that second one? How is your love for the body of Christ? Do you love the people in this room? I don't mean do you tolerate them. I don't mean do you wish them well and you live your life and they live their life and and you're happy to come together on Sunday morning, but, but I'm asking, do you love them? Does your passion burn to edify, to build up, to care for, and come alongside the people in this room and other Christians. How does it show? How does your life indicate that you really love other believers? What percentage of your time, would you say, is spent on intentional love for other Christians? Is it a high percentage? When you come to a meeting like this meeting or small groups or women's Bible study or any of a variety of other get-togethers, maybe just grabbing lunch with another believer, do you have those encounters, do you approach those encounters with a specific intent to bless them, to love them, to encourage other people? Do you think as you're driving here for a meeting, how can I do that? How can I reach out to my brother or sister? How can I spur him or her on to love and good deeds? Is that ever enter your mind? Or if it does happen, does that happen sort of on accident or in a, in a reaction to something? How about your conversations? How about your emails? Someone told me this week he thinks email is the worst thing that ever happened to the Christian church. Might be a slight overstatement, but you probably know what he means. We say things in emails we would never tell somebody to their face. Have you ever sent an email that you wish you hadn't sent? I have. A few of them. Conversations with people about others. Are you careful to make sure that you are speaking about others with love and encouragement? The stakes here are pretty high. Look at what he says in verse 24. The one who keeps his commandments, that is, to believe in the name of the Son and to love one another, the one who keeps these commandments abides in him and he in him. That is, 
They abide in Christ and Christ abides in them. Now what John here is doing is simply echoing what Jesus himself said back in John chapter 15. Let me read a portion of this to you and remind you of what Jesus said. He said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that he may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do lots of things. No? If you have a Bible that says that, throw it away. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather him and cast him into the fire. They are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another. And then here's the hardest phrase of the whole thing. Just as I have loved you. He says, here's my commandment to you, disciples. You love each other in the same way, in comparison to how I have loved you. How did Jesus love them? Well, he says, greater love has no one than this, that one lays down his life for his friends. That's the standard, beloved. When he says, love one another, he says, I'm telling you to love one another like I love you. I will give my life for you. And he did. Is our love for the people in this room, and I'm not talking about husbands and wives, I'm not talking about fathers to their children, I'm talking about for the greater family here, is our love for one another such that we would lay down our life for each other? That's the standard, and the stakes are high. He says, this is the one who abides in God, and God abides in him. He says back in 1 John now, at the end of verse 24, we know by this that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. What's the connection between the Spirit and this love? The Spirit produces that love. That's one of the fruit, right? It's the first one, love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. If you love the body of Christ, it is evidence that you really have been changed by the Spirit of God. Look at what he says back earlier in verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Did you catch that? How do you know you're a Christian? How do you know you truly have been forgiven, that you truly are a part of the elect. You love the church. That's what John says. You love the body of Christ. So much so that you would give your life for the body of Christ. If you don't have that kind of love for Christians, there's a reason to question your conversion. The stakes are high. So how you doing? What's the evidence like in your life? We need constant, repeated, daily reminders to love the body of Christ like this. Almost every morning when my family gathers together around the kitchen table and, and we do our devotional time and things, almost every morning I pray this for my kids. I pray this for each other, for them. See, my kids, and I'm sure this is only true of me, but in my family, my kids don't always get along well. And, and sometimes, uh, many times, 
quite often, okay, most of the time, they talk to each other in terms that are not always so loving and gentle. They say mean things, they tear each other down, they make fun of each other. Anybody, any of your other families has ever experienced any of that maybe once in a while? I see a hand over there. Yes. At least he's honest. It doesn't ooze out of us to be kind and selfless in relationships. We need to be reminded. So every morning I pray in front of them, Lord, help my children to love each other today, to be kind to each other, to speak words that build each other up, to not tear down and make fun and, and ridicule, not to embarrass and belittle, but, but to build up each other because they need it. They need reminders every day, and they definitely need the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. And sometimes God answers that prayer, and sometimes not as much. And so it is with the body of Christ. We are the family of God. We are brothers and sisters. That is one of the metaphors that is repeated over and over again in the scripture. We, right here in this room, are family. And you know what? Sometimes we don't speak kindly to one another. Sometimes we're harsh, we're bitter, we're unloving, we belittle, we tear down, we embarrass, just like little kids. It's like we never really grow out of that. We just get better at, at putting on a show at the right time. We need to be reminded of these things. Our words should be kind. Our desire should be to please Christ. Our overwhelming desire when we come together with other Christians should not be to get our way. It should not be to draw attention to ourselves. It should not be to lift ourselves up. Our overwhelming desire should be to encourage our brother or our sister to serve Christ faithfully. Not to tear them down, not to belittle them, not to discourage them, but to lift them up and push them further down the path of loving and serving Jesus Christ. That should be our goal every time we meet together. You're familiar with Hebrews 10.24? Consider, give careful thought to how you can stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Those are our marching orders as Christians. How are you doing in this? If you are a student of the Scripture, especially the New Testament, and you pay attention, you will see this is all over the place in the Scriptures. I want you to come with me on a journey here. I'm going to go back to the book of Romans, and I'm going to read to you every book of the New Testament. Okay, not really. Just making sure that, uh, that you haven't dozed off already. I want to walk you through some of these epistles, and I want, to, want you to see how often this, te this theme occurs. You're not going to find all of the same doctrinal issues in the different epistles of the New Testament, but you will find this command to love one another in every book. Think back with me to Romans, uh, the book of Romans. We've got 11 chapters of some heavy doctrine deep theology. Paul there describes who we are before God in our works, in our sin. We are condemned. And then he describes the wonderful, beautiful doctrine of justification by faith alone, that our only hope is trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and that is how we are declared righteous. And he talks about some of the results of that, how we have peace with God, and how in Adam we are all guilty, but in Christ we are all righteous. And then chapter 6, 7, and 8 talks about this new life we have, this resurrection power that, it out, that is ours. Chapter 9 gets into the heavy stuff about God's sovereignty and God's relationship with Israel and so on. And then we get to chapter 12, and we have the giant, therefore... In view of everything I've been saying, all of this doctrine, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And we read this about being transformed and not conformed and all that, and we start thinking about all the ways this should play out, but I want you to see how Paul plays this out. Verse 3 begins with the word for. He's continuing his thought. How do you present your body as a living sacrifice? This is the way. 
through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. And then he starts talking about how we are members together in this body, and you've got gifts that you should give to each other and bless each other. We're all members one of another. Then in verse 10, he says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. That means if you do get in a wrestling match with your brother, you get up and go have lunch together, smiling and happy to be there with each other. That's what brotherly love is, right? Those of you who have brothers, you know that. You pick on each other a little bit, push each other around, but you get over it in a heartbeat, and you go have lunch together. Give preference to one another in honor. Verse 13, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation, and so on. Then in chapter 13, he gets to our relationship to the government. But then in verse 8, he comes right back to the same theme. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, and now he quotes from the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And then he spends the entire chapter 14 explaining how we are to treat one another when we have some differences in our theology or our practice. The strong are to bear with the weak, the weak are not to condemn the strong. A whole chapter on this. Then in chapter 15, verse 7, he says, Therefore, accept one another. Then chapter 16. This is probably one of those chapters that gets left out a lot. We don't read this chapter a lot. It starts off with, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who's a servant, and then greet Prissa and Aquila and greet all these strange names and Mary and such and such and such, such. Why does he spend so much time commanding the church at Rome to greet all of these people? Because they're family. He says, I'm sending you to these people. Greet them for me. They're already there. Greet them for me. Greet them as you would your brother or sister. Love them. Appreciate them because we're all together as family. Then there's 1 Corinthians. Paul addresses many different doctrinal and practical issues. And then when he gets to chapter 12, he starts talking about spiritual gifts. And here is where he gives us this wonderful metaphor of we are all members of the same body and we need each other do you realize you need everybody else in this room i mean you need them he says when one of us is hurting we all hurt when all, one is honored we're all honored every one of you i've told you this before but it's worth repeating every single one of you is a body part i won't tell you which ones i think you are i'll leave i'll leave that to you in the spirit of god but you are a body part crucial to the well-being of the body and you are to use your gifts to edify one another and that chapter 12 leads of course into chapter 13 thank you I'm glad you're paying attention it's the love chapter right love is patient love is kind it keeps no record of wrongs and on and on and on you always hear that at weddings it's not a wedding chapter the last thing Paul said about weddings and marriage in this book was, don't get married. <laughs> he is saying, love one another in the body. Build each other up. Look at chapter 14, verse 1. Pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue, that is a, a different language, does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands. But in his spirit he speaks ministry, min, uh, mysteries. But one, of the, one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and consolation. He says pursue gifts, but pursue that you can prophesy so you can build each other up. We all are structures being erected for the glory of God, and we need other people to contribute to our building. That's our job with our gifts. How can we make each other love Christ and serve Christ more faithfully? Build each other up. 
Console one another, exhort one another, challenge one another, encourage one another. That's what we're called to do. So the Corinthians. Then we get to Galatians. And here again, Paul is dealing with some very heavy doctrinal issues. There are Jews coming down and trying to bring the church back to Israel and the the Mosaic law and such. And Paul has to wrestle with all that and say, don't go there. You've been freed and such. You've been freed from that law. And then here's what he says in verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. On and on he goes with how we are to treat each other in love, in deference, in kindness, and encouragement. Book of Ephesians. Three chapters of wonderful doctrine and doxology. God's election, God's grace, God's promises, all that he has done. You were dead in sin, but God has made you alive. All the mystery of Israel and the church and all that. And then chapter 4, another therefore. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. How do you do that? With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He gets into some other things, and he comes right back to the theme in verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not let the devil get an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that we will have something to share with the one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, for building up according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. And on he goes. Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete, says the Apostle, by being of the same mind, Maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one one purpose, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God to be grasped. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of man. His purpose was to serve others, to bless others, to build up others, and he gave himself to this very end. Colossians, the children of the Gaylor family read some of this already, chapter 3, verse 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And on and on, same things in 1st 2nd Thessalonians and Timothy, Hebrews, we'll come back to that in a couple of weeks. 1st Peter, let me highlight a couple of verses here in 1st Peter. Chapter 1, verse 22 says, Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. And then chapter 4, verse 8 says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Now I want you to see what he said in verse 7. 
The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober for the purpose of prayer. This is a big statement. The end is coming. Think well and pray. But then he says, above all, above what I've been saying, above even the sober judgment of the return of Christ and prayer, above all, keep fervent in your love. Don't just tolerate don't just wish each other well. Have a passion to love the body of Christ above all, he says. In 2 Peter, in the first chapter, one of the fruit that we bear that proves our election is loving one another. And then if you've studied 1 John, you know this is one of the major themes woven throughout the book. If you say you love Christ, but you don't love your brother, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. Over and over and over again, beloved. Not every book deals with the same theology and the same doctrines. Paul writes to this church, and there's some specific questions he has to answer. Paul writes to this church, and there's specific things they need to know. Remember, the church was in its infancy, and there were many doctrines that had not been fleshed out yet. Not everyone knew all these things. And Paul writes here and there and everywhere saying, do this, do this, believe this, believe this. This is unpacking the gospel, unpacking who God is, unpacking who Jesus is. But in all of them... There is a repeated emphasis on loving others. Is that significant? I think so. I think it's extremely significant. Because this is his command. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and love one another. That's how you abide in Christ, by loving his people. We don't always do this, do we? Just like in our families at home, our broader family, it's not always natural for us to put each other ahead of ourselves. We have to be told, we have to be reminded, we have to be exhorted over and over again. There's a flip side of this. One of the reasons God wants us to build each other up is because we all need to be built Every one of us. We are projects, construction projects that are still under construction. We have not been made complete yet. We don't love others like we should. We don't believe as strongly as we should. And we need to be building each other up because we all need to be built. Isolation and getting off by yourself is a sure way to fail. God has put us in community. He's put us in a body with different body parts. He's put us in a building where we're all building on top of one another. He's put us in a family with brothers and sisters. All these metaphors conveying the fact that we are intertwined and we need each other. You need, you need the people in this room. I need the people in the room. You need me. I need you. If we pull away and get by ourselves, we're in great danger zone. The Proverbs 18.1 says, the one who gets alone or the one who isolates himself seeks his own desire. It's a selfish move to withdraw from the body and get alone. We need each other. We need each other to correct us, to encourage us, to point out some areas that maybe are concerning. We need one another, one another to say, you know what? Yeah, you failed. Yes, you fell down, but let me help you up and put your, your eyes on the cross again. You sinned again, that's true, but look to Christ. The reason we're in the same family is because we all believe that Jesus took our sin on his person. So let me help you get back up and keep fighting the good fight. We must have that. We start walking with the wrong crowd. Bad company corrupts good morals, the scripture says. We need to walk with the wise. We need to walk with those who will help us in our journey. We all need to be built, and we need each other to do the building. God has provided means for this building up. He's given us shepherds. We've been talking about that recently. He's given us elders to oversee, to teach, and to exhort, but he's also given us one, one another. Every one of us has a role to play in building up the body of Christ. You are a builder, are you intentional in building? 
Beloved, let me just say this very candidly. You cannot come here on Sunday morning. You cannot come here and sit side by side facing me and do the kind of work that is required to build each other up. Now, you might be able to encourage one another a little bit, passing in the hall. You might be able to look around and say, let's sing together, let's praise the Lord together. But if that's all of your building project, you're failing the rest of us. Because we need you in our lives building us up. You can't just come on Sunday morning. This has to be part of your regular purpose in life, to encourage the body of Christ. Sometimes you're at a real low and you need more building than you're doing building, but the end result that we hope is that you'll be strong enough one of these days to turn and start building somebody else. That's what we need to be doing. We have a great enemy, a tremendous enemy who gets in the way and opposes our constructing. The big enemy we have is ourself. The thing that keeps you and me from loving others and from building up others more than anything else is right here. We spend a lot of time protecting ourselves, defending ourselves, being by ourselves, worrying about ourselves. And as long as we've got our eyes focused on ourselves, we cannot be focused on somebody else. We've got to constantly fight the battle of the self and look to bless others and be a benefit to others. And the problem is, we call ourselves by the name of the one who gave himself for the good of others. It must not remain that way. We must look to how we can build each other I want to remind you of something I reminded my wife of last night. I don't do the convicting. That's the Spirit's job. If you're convicted right now, it's the Spirit. My job is just to communicate truth. But this is heavy on my heart. Not because I think we're miserable at this. Because like Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, we need to excel still more. We can never get comfortable with our level of inputting to the lives of others, with our level of building each other up and exhorting one another. I taught similar things to the uh, Ignite ministry several months ago, edification, building up. I would love to know how much of what I taught has stuck and what a difference it has made in anybody's lives. Because it's easy to hear these things, it's easy for me to study these things and get real excited about this and then get off on some other things for a few months and forget. We must remember this is the repeated frame over and over in the New Testament, love one another. And that's why I'm preaching this series, not to rebuke and scold, but to encourage. Let's do this more and more and more. My desire is that every time you're going to meet with another Christian, every time you're going to exchange communication with another Christian, you have a singular purpose. That's to build them up in Christ. I've got, a, I've got three questions to ask you as we wrap this up. Here's the first one. Examine your conversations of the last week, last few days, last several weeks. Have you said things that are discouraging and destructive to others? Have you said things you probably shouldn't have said? Where your intention in speaking them was not their building up, but they're tearing down? Now let me give you a little clue as to how maybe you've done that. Here's how to discover that. Right now, did the conversation just jump to your mind that you're defending to yourself? Well, but... He had it coming. Well, but, but, but maybe, just maybe, not all the time, but maybe the instant conversation that comes to mind that you're now defending indicates your intentions were not entirely selfless. Think about it. Had there been conversations that were not intended to build up others? 
Number two, are you committed to the people of this body or are you committed to the things you like here? Are you committed to the people of this body or is your commitment really to what you like about this church? So that if, if change takes place, you might be looking for another body. Because the real commitment is not to the people here, but it's to the stuff that you like, which is ultimately more about me than it is about loving others. And there are a host of different things we could fill in there. You know, when we moved into this building and went to one service, one of the questions we had to wrestle with is, what time do we do Sunday school? What time do we do worship service? And Lord willing, one of these days, we're going to have to struggle that in reverse and decide to go to two services. And we're going to have to go back and say, do we do it the way we used to? Do we do it a different way? Is there a better way? And no matter what we decided, we knew people were not going to like it. Is that enough to cause somebody to say, you know what? I'm out of here. If it is, doesn't it indicate that our commitment's not to the people, but it's the things we like? One of the things, as you know, that we're wrestling with is the structure and purpose of small groups. We've had a, a wonderful period for many, many years now of small groups the way they are, and they have been a huge blessing. And I, I speak with, with uh, I was going to say pride, but that's probably not the word I'm supposed to use in this context. I, I, I speak with pleasure and delight when I talk to my pastor friends about what our small groups are. It's one of the things that sets us apart, I think, uniquely. But we have a very good problem to deal with. We're growing. And we can't keep everything exactly the way it is. And so as, as many of you know, and if you don't know, you'll be finding out more about it, we as elders are struggling with what do we do? What's the best way to handle the growth and keep the, the principle behind our, our eldership? And we want your input on this. We're going to be talking about this as small groups. Some of you already have. Others of you will be talking very soon. And we're going to have an all-wide, all-church strategic meeting on October 3rd. Put it on your calendars. We want your input. We want your feedback. We want your ideas that maybe we haven't thought of, your concerns. We, we want everyone's opinion. Now, of course, we're not going to re, you know, please everyone in that decision either. We understand that. But we want to know because there are things maybe that we haven't thought of. And we're going to do it such that we're going to meet together for our worship service, and then we're going to go have a quick bite to eat in the other room, and we're going to come right back here at 1230 or 1, and have a, a planning meeting, a strategic meeting. It'll also be the budget approval meeting. So come, if you're a member especially, come, because we need you to approve the budget for the next year. But even if you're not in small groups, even if you're not a, an official member, come to that meeting and share your thoughts on small group. Maybe it's something now you'd like to get a part of. But we as elders understand that no matter how we come down at the end of all this discussion, it's not going to fit everybody's desires perfectly. It's just, it can't happen. It won't happen if two of us are deciding, much less 352 of us. Now, if we make decisions that are not to your liking, are you out of here? Or are you committed to the people of this church? And you like small groups the way they are and such, but, you know, you trust the elders that we're going to, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, going to make good decisions, and ultimately your concern is how can I edify others, not what, how everything fits my, my needs and my lifestyle. Are you more committed to the people of this church or to the things that you like here? Number three, what things did you do last week for the express purpose of building up and loving your brothers and sisters? Do things jump to mind? Do you have some? Yes, this was intentional. I was really trying to build him up or build her up. I hope you can think of something. Even if you haven't, even if you didn't, even if, if you're feeling the weight and the heavy hand of the Spirit this morning in conviction, let me encourage you, today's a new day. And this week is a new week. And the reason that John put the gospel first and Christ first and faith in Christ first is because that's where it all starts. And maybe you've failed in this area. Maybe you've not loved your brothers and sisters the way you should. Guess what? There's hope for you because Christ died for that sin too. And now 
that you're no longer living in ignorance, but you've come to the light, let me exhort you, live this week, live today. There are many hours left in this day. As you go out of here and talk together in the foyer, be thinking, how can I be intentional in building someone else up? Not make them feel good. That's not the gospel. Not telling somebody how pretty they are, how nice their new hairdo looks, you know. Women telling your girlfriend how great her shoes are, that's not edification. And talking about football and how, you know, your football team is really doing great after one week, <laughs> um, that's not edification. <laughs> and it's not a personal attack if you remind me how miserable my St. Louis Rams are. That's okay. I know they're miserable. I'm talking biblical building up. How to help your brother or sister be encouraged in the gospel, to love Christ and live in light of it, to, to serve him faithfully. That's biblical edification. When you go out of here, I want you to think of one thing that you can say to someone and then not just think it, but do it, that might encourage them in the faith. It's what we're called to do, beloved. You want a purpose for your life, which I hope you do, it doesn't get much better than this. Love one another and thus please Christ. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, my request is very, very simple and short because the command is very, very simple and short. And yet as simple as it is, it's not easy. Make us a people who truly love your people that we might be sure that we have been brought out of darkness into light. That the world might know that we are disciples by our love. That we might abide in the vine who is the source of all hope and strength. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Music team, come and lead us in one last song.